And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to hand over to uh, Javier Haas, who's our moderator, um, and we'll bring on our panelists for the webinar session um, on psychedelics. And here you'll have a range of expertise. And you know, from a from a mechanics perspective, given the the relative um, early stages of this this industry, uh, we're very proud to have to be able to call on folks from all different aspects of the industry, from from law to cultivation, from you know, folks doing stuff in new jurisdictions like St. Vincent with Pete, um, Doc Dreisel with, you know, Simon of the, you know, sort of more of a corporate perspective. Um, Amanda uh, Ilian is doing a lot of work in terms of ABLE partners in terms of, you know, funding different ventures. So for us, it's a very exciting opportunity as Canex to be able to facilitate this. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to my much more capable um, friend, uh, Javier Haas from Venting and Cannabis. Uh, Javier. Over to you, my friend, and thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you for the kind words and uh, everyone for, for joining us today. Um, I, I think, you know, we should just jump right in. Uh, our idea here is we have six great panelists from uh, every different part of the, of the value creation chain in the, in the psychedelics industry. And what we thought is we touch on, on all these topics, right? From the start to the very end. So from cultivation to investing and everything in between. So, you know, let's just get to it. Um, the first thing I would like to do is maybe have each one of our panelists uh, introduce themselves briefly and, and tell us a little bit about what they do in the industry. Um, let's start with Joe, uh, since, you know, it's, it's where it all starts, okay. the cultivation. Sounds great. Um, well, my name is Joseph Frank. Uh, I'm here in Montego Bay, Jamaica. Um, I'm the lead cultivator and manager for Jamaican operations for Silo Wellness. Thank you. Peter? Uh, good morning and thank you for having me. My name is Peter Holsworth. Um, I'm referred to as the chief rainmaker at uh, SVG Micro Research, uh, where we are currently uh, embarking on the discovery of psychedelic effects on homeostasis. Great. Ruth? Good morning, everyone. My name is Ruth, and I'm very glad to be here. I'm a lawyer. Don't hold that against me. Um, so I've been working in plant-based medicine for several years now. I did work at a publicly listed licensed producer in cannabis, and I've since pivoted into psychedelics. So um, advising various businesses from startups all the way to those that are going public. And I like to think of myself as a success facilitator. I like that. Everything you say and do today will be held to your advantage. So, <laughs> Doug. Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm Doug Drysdale. I'm the CEO of Cybin Corp. We're a life sciences company uh, developing psychedelic pharmaceutical products for treatmental disorders. Uh, lead programs in men is a phase two program aimed at treating men uh, major depressive disorder. Thank you, Doug. Amanda? Um, I am the co-founder of Able Partners. We're an early stage venture capital firm and we focus on uh, the positive living space and closing the wellness gap, which is a disconnect between measures of economic well-being and physical and mental well-being. Um, as part of our focus on mental health, we have been investing in the psychedelic space over the last several years and believe that it's one of the most transformative uh, approaches to improving mental health globally. Thank you. And last but not least, Irie. You're muted. <laughs> Thanks. That's better. Uh, thank you for having me as well. Um, I do a few things in the can uh, in the psychedelics industry, coming from the cannabis industry. Um, so I've uh, founded um, Rise Wellness Retreat, which is in Jamaica, and that's where you can find out more about that microdosing stuff that Bruce was mentioning. So you can find us down uh, in Treasure Beach on the south coast. There we are currently on hiatus. I've also co-founded Sancero Life Sciences, which is a bioscience company based here in Canada. And we exist to bring to market the formulations um, of microdose um, through clinical trials. Um, and I also have a cafe up here in Canada, which is our most recent endeavor, which was sort of what to do when the world gives 
uh, gives you no travel and uh, takes you away from Jamaica, uh, you open a cafe apparently called uh, A Good Mushroom, which is at Bathurst and College, and we exist to have the conversation about mushrooms um, and to offer functional mushrooms. Not uh, It's good, but it's not that good. Um, and uh, I also um, have been facilitating ceremony and working with plant medicines uh, and patients for over 10 years um, and uh, an advocate for psychedelics across the board. Great. And, you know, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Javier Jase. I'm CEO of Spanish language uh, site El Planteo and managing director for Benzinga Cannabis. We also do psychedelics. And that is one of the debates we'll have today. Why do people tie in cannabis and psychedelics? Should they be uh, connected in, in some way? Shouldn't they be connected? Like, what's the relationship there? Why, why do we see so many people from the cannabis industry, uh, you know, transition to the psychedelics industry? Why do people compare it on the finance side, on the legality side, right? So, you know, let's open the debate with that one. Whomever wants to go. No, you know, I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, I really believe it's the pioneering nature of uh, reclassifying or declassifying, descheduling these once prohibited drugs. Uh, I think what we've come to realize is there's a new paradigm shift taking place in the global consciousness that the synthetic options that we've turned to as corrective behavior in our societies have really led to a lot of negative results, whether within our health or the Western medicine's developing of prescribing a, a new synthetic to treat another synthetic symptom. Uh, I believe that we're actually going through a, a, an age of conscious awakeness where we're looking back into more homeo or holistic options to affect your homeostasis in more positive ways that have long-term effects without any negative side effects. So I think that uh, it's time for us to make this change. I think that's a great point. Um, I'll speak from the patient's journey. Sorry, Amanda, I, I was unmuted, so I decided to just go for it. Um, you know, when people are using cannabis, having worked with so many individuals, once they find that basic quality of life that cannabis provides through uh, pain relief or improved sleep health, uh, you know, reduced stress, and they start to feel better in, in their physical body, um, often that next question is, why do I still feel this way? You know, why am I still um, having these depressive episodes or this negative self-talk um, and, and, you know, these, these loops and these routines that, that we get stuck in? So that's where the conversation sort of naturally for many of the early adopters into cannabis uh, starts to focus on psychedelics. And of course, with um, all of the media focus on it, and I mean, with Paltrow on Netflix talking about it and all of these things, people are starting to actually talk about it. And we do need that consumer awareness and demand to meet regulation, to push science, to push regulation and so on and so forth as we build this. So I think that's some similarities there, um, but also many differences um, and I hope we talk about those, especially the recreational piece, but I'll stop now. Yeah, um, I'll just, you know, give my two cents from the investor perspective. Um, I think the common thread that we see is, you know, that these are formally stigmatized substances. Our fund started out focusing on wellness and it's sort of ironic that cannabis and psychedelics now both fall under an umbrella of wellness and are showing up on one of our other portfolio companies uh, like Goop. Um, so I think that um, there are, um, probably more differences than people um, realize, you know, in terms of psychedelics being more of a service and cannabis being more of a product, but we can go into that later. Um, but I definitely think investors very quickly drew that parallel in terms of these being formally stigmatized substances. I'll, I'll go at that question from a regulatory and risk perspective. So cannabis obviously was, is highly regulated. And as Peter had mentioned, is a nascent industry just because of changes to the laws. We're seeing that in the U.S. with state by state changes. Um, Bruce had previously, Bruce and Douglas had previously mentioned the Oregon ballot. Michigan also just made an announcement. So there are changes. With cha legal change comes opportunity. Um, I, I absolutely echo what you say about it's not, cannabis is not psych psychedelics. Like they're not the same. Yes, they both come from plants potentially, but the, um, um, I know yesterday, Amanda, we were talking about the scientific pharmaceutical IP aspects of psychedelics. So that's very different. So from a regulatory perspective, I think there's an opportunity. And then risk tolerance, right? So from a entrepreneur and investor standpoint, I think those investors that were early into cannabis and saw an opportunity and could take on that, that risk of something that, you know, decades ago was um, part of the war on drugs. I think that, that risk tolerance profile is probably similar among the entrepreneurs and the investors we're seeing now. If you don't mind me coming in, 
I would the- say that for the, the lay people, it's, it's a little um, common because they were both substances that were formerly illegal. Um, there is a lot of stigma attached to them and not a lot of education. And that recently uh, we found a lot of medical and uh, medical purposes for both of these substances. So it's very easy for people who don't know a lot about it and don't have a lot of the education to draw parallels. Yeah, I'll just say from a, a drug development perspective, psychedelics and cannabis are kind of the opposite of each other. You know, a lot of uh, recreational uh, background with, with cannabis, but really quite difficult to develop cannabinoids into drugs, often because they work in combination and developing combination drugs is, is very challenging. For psychedelics, there's a tremendous science background, thousands of papers and great research out of major centers like Johns Hopkins and NYU and Imperial College, I think uh, create a really strong platform for future drug development. And I would like to stay with you just for a second since you mentioned uh, clinical evidence as many may know and many may not. Uh, certain psychedelic substances have been studied, uh, you know, in, in clinical settings, and, and, and we have been studying them for decades now, right? Uh, so we, we have certain evidence, you know, scientific evidence that psychedelics can treat certain mental conditions. What do we know and what do we expect to find out in the next few years, right? Because there are a lot of clinical trials underway, similar to what we saw in cannabis, right? where we are seeking to prove what we anecdotally have seen. Uh, so where do we stand and what do we know and what do we need to find out? Yeah, it's true. I mean, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of studies that are done out of many uh, universities. Um, those studies aren't all performed uh, with uh, a common standard, right? So, but, but they're, they're very helpful. They're, they're indicative. I think as over the next few years, as we see, um, controlled randomized clinical studies being performed uh, um, on, on a common platform. And we're following up um, patients over, over longer periods of time and in the real world, right? That will really start to see uh, how these treatments can be beneficial, but also how they can scale. And frankly, I, I see challenges ahead, not just in drug development, but in scaling access you know, to, to these medications, future medications. You know, a four to six hour treatment session, for example, with, with psilocybin, is not what we're used to when we're treating, when we're treating depression. And it's a, so I think there'll be a focus, and we're certainly looking at this, focus on down the line, once we, once we get over the, this hurdles of regulatory approval, how do we improve the patient experience? How do we uh, help uh, get a faster onset of action? How do we shorten that duration, treatment duration, so that more people can get access to these, these uh, future drugs? Anyone else want to add anything on the state of the science? Um, well, I'm pretty interested in how it um, disables the default mode network in the brain um, and how that associates with a lot of different traumas and um, subconscious issues that we deal with. So I'm definitely eager to see uh, where the science goes in that direction. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, uh, sorry, did anyone want to add anything? I uh, no, just, you know, I was going to just sort of, um, it's important that we realize that we haven't had any real innovation in our mental health pharmaceuticals um, in, in my lifetime. And, you know, we have this sort of single molecule approach to, to what we've been doing. So, you know, kind of coming, you know, apropos of the cannabis question, you know, is there similarities? Uh, you know, we're looking at how we can uh, use, you know, combine do drug combinations. And I know that there's several other companies that are focusing on this as well. And at Sancero, we're really looking to have uh, a greater increased access. So as you know, there's so much science going on, of course, we have breakthrough status um, being fast tracked through with MDMA and then psilocybin to follow. So how do we reach as many people as possible? And that's where, for my personal, uh, my personal opinion, having worked with patients so much, that's what we really need. We need innovation in what people are taking every single day to treat this, um, this human condition. I would just add on, although I don't come at it from a scientific perspective, you know, it's related to our investment thesis, which is the potential we believe for psychedelics is so broad because when you look at mental health disorders on a spectrum, and if you look at it on a spectrum from too much entropy or chaos, which would be things like psychoses or schizophrenia, um, all the way to the other end, which is um, too much rigidity. And if you look at that bucket of too much rigidity, which is everything from depression, anxiety, eating disorders, 
um, addiction, OCD, which is really the, the vast majority of, of diagnosed mental illness right now, um, psychedelics show potential to treat everything sort of in that basket. And then even more broadly, um, if you look at CNS, central nervous system disorders, um, you know, they're, they're being researched for things outside of mental illness. Um, so I think, you know, we haven't identified all the mechanisms mechanisms of action. We certainly know, you know, silencing the default mode network is probably helpful for mental health, but there's also an anti-inflammatory um, effect. There's also, you know, a whole body analgesic effect. Um, so I think when, you know, a lot more science still needs to be done and we're big advocates of making sure that, um, you know, we're actually doing the right clinical trials um, to today's standards. But if you look at from 1940 to 1970, we had 40,000 U.S. clinical research participants using psychedelics. Um, and of course, as Doug mentioned, those were not done to the standards of today's trials, but I think you can find some signal in the noise there and it makes it really interesting to pursue for like a really large um, number of indications. Just to wrap up on the science side, um, I think the science that's coming out is very exciting. Um, and part of that is also intellectual property, right? So I think there might be a bit of a race, but it's also gonna be a lot of innovation. And I think those who can actually secure actual real patents um, that are enforceable will be, will be big winners. Do you have a quick note? Yeah, before, like, just, uh, you know, a little quick note. How do you secure a patent nowadays? I mean, is it is it viable or is it similar to other controlled substances? How realistically can, like, how, how viable is it to get a psychedelic compound patented? Well, I think it comes down to the uniqueness standpoint. And I know um, we all think our children are unique um, just because you produce something in a lab and you think it's special doesn't mean it is necessarily going to pass the the threshold of the, the uniqueness factor and the defendability factor in IP. Um, I'm not an IP specialist, but definitely getting, you can either go at it from the process or from the formulation. Um, the process might be something that may be more accessible. Um, but yeah, I think there are going to be big barriers to an entry and that's where the real good science, the uh, big institutions that are actually enforcing it, they're going to be the ones who will be able to actually do it. And I just want to note, I think it's important um, that we remember that, you know, psilocybin as a molecule itself, which is one of the, you know, ones that so many are focusing on, um, pennies, you know, there's, there's no money in actually creating this molecule itself. So it really is around those, uh, those methods and, uh, and, and the combinations there as well. So um, few people, a uh, few people are actually already um, doing the work here in Canada and uh, it's really exciting. So one of the uh, the topics we brought up a couple times already uh, relates to to uh, the process, right, of administering the method, right, the the actual session versus just the substance, right, and and that seems to be a constant in in many of the psychedelic projects. Um, can we go a little bit into that? The, uh, the necessary use of, the, of psychedelics in a therapeutic and guided manner, uh, unlike cannabis, and here's a good way to draw a contradiction, um, you, know, you can take too much of these substances and, and it can have adverse effects. And one of the things I think we're challenged with in, in the professional industry here is manufacturing correct dosage amounts in the microdose setting that will have beneficial long-term lasting effects on homeostasis and mental health. Um, I'd like to highlight Irie actually because pioneering her efforts at Treasure Island with Rise Wellness has been a great example of how a controlled therapeutic microdose setting can really have long-term lasting effects on a person's mental well-being. And he does, he's not just saying that because he's been to the retreat. <laughs> Um, but speaking from personal experience, let me just know I didn't pay fee to say that. Um, you know, really, I think that's an opportunity just to discuss the integrative health that is so crucial around these medicines. So as we look at the science of it, uh, I'm constantly reminding people that, you know, this, uh, if we look at this substance as, say, a tool, we have to learn skills around it. So, you know, you have to sort of have that in your mind as sort of step two or three on this, on this journey to wellness, because without that preparation, without the integrative support around that experience, some of these experiences can be um, even more confusing than they are. And you come out with, with more questions than you do answers. And so, you know, managing expectations, especially as we look at, 
the evolving mental health needs um, coming out of COVID and these sorts of things, we need to reevaluate how we look at healthcare. And I believe that psychedelics is an opportunity to do that. So how can we support the whole person a little bit more with that integrative wellness? Uh, and I do believe that, you know, the counseling and the different, um, different healing modalities around that, uh, whether you want to call them uh, ancient or historical or whatever the case, um, we know them to be true and they've been supporting humanity for millennia. So let's legitimize it, let's regulate it, and let's get it out to people at a time when we need it the most. I mean, I think this is, you know, this is a really important point and it sort of ties back to what the opportunities are for, uh, you know, entrepreneurs and investors in the space. You know, we have the, the clinical data that shows that, you know, set and setting and facilitation absolutely are tied to outcome. And if you want to op um, optimize specifically for therapeutic purposes, you do need trained facilitators. Um, and this is an entirely do, you know, different model of, of treatment delivery, of drug delivery. And what does it mean to have um, you know, drug assisted psychotherapy, which is essentially what this is, and how do you pay for that? And when you look at gaining access and getting into the US medical care system, how do payers reimburse for an episodic treatment, which isn't just a pill, but requires all of this service and facilitation piece? And from a value creation perspective, you know, who is creating that protocol and, and who is doing that facilitation and, and where is, um, you know, where is the value creation and capture in that cycle? So I think that's, you know, one of the key questions that we're thinking about in the space. I think uh, the way we're trying to approach things uh, with FDA, you know, because you're right, FDA is not used to com uh, combining therapy and, and drugs together. That, that's not a defined pathway. So rather, rather than call this uh, drug assisted therapy, I think we'd prefer, prefer to call it uh, therapy assisted medication. And with the focus on the medication from a, from an FDA perspective, just to keep them focused on on the drug itself and the pathway, and not not overcomplicate this. Otherwise, it just creates more barriers to to getting that first approval. So, what, one of the debates we we're having, you know, uh, the other day, revolved around um, how many people this would reach, right? And Bruce was talking about a recreational market, which I've seen and and personally don't think it's it's huge uh and 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 then you know you were we we're talking about for instance uh these therapy sessions taking four to six hours and they're intense right so do you think this limits the amount of people it will reach will we be able to come up with more user-friendly experiences right uh and and you know one of the the, the metaphors or you know kind of things i said uh to you, the panelists, uh, during our uh, call before this is, you know, I can see my mother, you know, 72, 73 year olds cozying up to CBD drops, but not so much to mushrooms, right? So how do we bridge that gap? And, and you know, is there anything in the horizon there? Um, so I actually um, have many senior citizens call me <laughs> to come down to the retreat. Um, and I think that is because of the different approach that we take. Um, with the microdosing uh, integrative wellness. So there is incredible value to having a deep dive, to have that intensive therapeutic experience, um, you know, the psychotherapy assisted, and um, to really do that deep work. And we can kind of liken it to the metaphor of, you know, if you were to go swimming. So, you know, there's great value in doing that deep work and, and coming up with something that you can take home with you and an experience that you'll be integrating. But there's also great value to, you know, dipping your feet in the water and cooling them off. And, you know, there's also great value to even just taking a walk by the river. So, you know, if we can look at it, you know, everyone, you have to meet people where they are at. And from an industry, we have to ensure that we're not leaving any gaps for people because this is such important medicine. So how do we reach as many people as possible? And for us at RISE um, and then at Sancero as well, it's been about having these microdose um, formulations available, which uh, support daily routines that are not interrupting people that are not you're not facing your humanity, you're not taking a huge deep dive and, you know, having to come back and take a week off. Um, and I do recommend to take a couple of days off because you need to integrate that kind of thing. But there is something in psychedelics for everyone. And I'm hopeful that in this industry, especially in this nascent moment, that we really acknowledge how many different applications psychedelics can have, um, especially with the indications that Amanda mentioned earlier as well. Just want to chime in on that one. I definitely agree with Irie. I think that um, in specific to, to Javier's example of his mother, that, that people 
who would not go for the six hour treatment, who would not be interested in the psychedelic deep dive, would definitely be interested in the microdose. That having small metered doses, there's a whole community online of people who um, practice microdosing every, every week. You know, they'll do a couple days on, a couple days off. Uh, and they get a lot of the benefits, they get the raised endorphins, the neuroplasticity, and they don't have to end up delving as deeply into the psychological issues as you would with a, a psychedelic dose. You know, Javier, though, it's interesting, despite these perceived hurdles, uh, like the four to six hour session, the wait lists for the current studies that are ongoing, Compass and USONA and, and other folks, the wait lists are long. A lot of people want to get into these studies and uh, uh, because depression is such a, a, a significant issue. So I, I do think there'll be a demand despite the, the hurdles. Um, that said, I think it's, um, you know, it's on us to, to be innovative and find ways to improve the experience. So we're working on ways, for example, to uh, increase, uh, speed up the onset of action with our sublingual film. We're working on some novel molecules that could potentially reduce the treatment duration and reduce the side effects. So over time, I think we'll see innovation uh, lead the way and we'll, we'll see improvements to that experience. But uh, we're, we're seeing demand in the studies that is you know, pretty unprecedented, actually. Javier, back to your mother. Um, so Martha Stewart is now selling CBD um, um, pat de fruit, right? So she's she's all over and good for her for, for marketing those and for selling those. Um, the fact that she has now normalized CBD to this extent, right? And that may perhaps your 72 year old mother would consider CBD um, comes back to normalization and education. So I think those two things are things that need to happen. Um, education on psychedelics, microdosing, on the science when it comes to things that are more clinical and also on the therapies, what Doug mentioned on off, onset, offset, what Ari mentioned about, you know, the recovery from when you've gone through one of those journeys. Um, the other piece too is the broader context on transformation with me mental health generally in the world, right? I mean, I think Bruce alluded to it in terms of his, his, his regression over COVID having been in this very, you know, unprecedented times. I don't know how many times I've said that this year, um, but the mental health conversation that's happening globally, I think is also part of the conversation that will facilitate, you know, all the businesses on, the, on this panel, all the investments that everyone is making. Um, and I think that's really a, a, an opportunity for a seismic shift. I did want to mention one other thing before we moved on to another subject is that um, I actually do disagree with the majority of the panel in regards to the recreational. Um, there, I, I do have some connections to the black market back in the United States and thousands of pounds of mushrooms are sold across the country every day. Um, there are many people who go to festivals and uh, EDM concerts and sometimes even just sort of like to go for a walk in the park. Um, there are many people who are very active within that, within that recreational community, even though it's illegal. And I do think that there is actually going to be quite a large space for that in the future. I'm going to just quickly, I completely agree. Um, I have this conversation, like we have the cafe, people come in, that's what they're talking about. This is happening. Um, people are microdosing. And then we have groups in Canada like Therasil and the decriminalized nature movements across the states. Um, and I urge people to um, familiarize themselves with them. I also shared the maps and Maps Canada, which will be looking at these regulations. Um, and I guess, you know, coming from, I mean, I'm, I'm an old rave kid, to be perfectly honest, like plur forever, if anyone knows what that means. Um, but, you know, the, the reality is we need standardization around that. We need safety. So, you know, even if, you know, I do want people to feel comfortable taking what we call like a museum dose, right, that little bit to go and have that nature walk and have that experience. These are plant allies. These, um, these are not to be criminalized. You know, I'm, we're at this beautiful, amazing moment where we get to rethink it. So, you know, but how do we standardize that and how do we create safety and, and regulation for people en masse? And again, I know I keep coming back to it, but it's, you know, it's being able to have access to something that um, is going to improve your life and enhance your life, but not disrupt it. And that's not, not to say that a psychedelic a macrodose does, but um, all of these side effects that people get from so many different, uh, you know, SSRIs where they're reporting, you know, 30% are ineffective. So if we have something that people could take as needed as well, it's just a different way to rethink um, what, how we've looked at pharmaceuticals, I think. Just to, just to build on Iris' point really quickly, I had the privilege of uh, building the regulatory framework which the state of Washington utilized to launch its recreational cannabis industry. 
And as the CIO CFO of Biotrack, it was a privilege to be able to construct what we believed at the time was the first closed loop system for a regulated, regulated substance to be distributed within a you know, bifurcated state regulatory system. And the most important parts of that really were centered around building that closed loop system, ensuring there was no illegal or illicit drug diversion or uh, inversion into the system, that there weren't any bad actors participating in any kind of money laundering or illegal activity, and that we were dispensing the products to the appropriate persons to receive them. Uh, I think this is quintessentially important for the framework in order to advance this industry forward for therapeutic value in that we are having controlled and licensed producers of this product entering into a standardized system by which they're measured. They're measured for quality and consistency. They're measured for anything harmful as, um, that could damage the quality of the medicine or the patient taking it. And then furthermore, that is dispensed by a licensed professional that has a controlled environment by which they are directly applying this into a standard operating procedure, which results in the benefit for human homeostasis. I completely agree with Pete, but I do want to say I also don't really see anything wrong with someone saying, hey, I know how to grow this. I'm in a legal environment such as Jamaica, where I grew up, as you know, I, I completely understand where you're coming from as well, Joe. So um, it, that's why we have this beautiful moment with, you know, the decriminalized nature um, and then all of this regulatory and science coming along with it, because we want this to reach everyone. So, you know, the people who are comfortable uh, making tea, please, by all means, you know, get in touch with your decriminalized nature. But for the rest of everyone else, exactly what Pete said, we need to get this out to as many people as possible. Yeah, for sure. Now, let me play, you know, the devil's advocate for a second. How likely do you think it is for governments to go ahead and say, okay, you can buy psychedelics legally? Because like I've seen them decriminalized. I walked into a store in a, you know, what what is supposed to be a gray area in, in Amsterdam and and you know, acquired pretty controlled truffles, you know, from a fridge and they were sealed and everything. But let's say like personally, I don't see many governments around the world going trip freely, you know. Do you see it as a possibility? Do you see it as something that that might catch on, you know, a recreational market and well, not uh, the medical side. Just, just speaking from a standpoint here in the United States, uh, both Denver and uh, um, Portland have, uh, have decriminalized. So we're looking at, uh, I'm sorry, Oakland, excuse me, um, have decriminalized. But recently the dispensation of, of uh, psilocybin containing mushrooms was um, actually uh, enforced and a church that had started up in Oakland called the Side Door had been raided and uh, prosecuted. So although that we are making steps towards decriminalization of possession, the distribution still remains a very illegal activity here in the United States. Um, there are several different states moving forward, as mentioned, I believe Ruth mentioned earlier, um, Michigan has recently signed on and, and, and put legislation possibly on their ballot. I've heard rumors of New York also making actions in that sense. So the tide wave is changing, but um, there still are some very serious legal hurdles in the distribution of the medicine as not everybody's going to be cultivating their own mushrooms or knows how to or should be in that medicine. I would say that when you're discussing the recreational aspect, um, when you compare it to cannabis or pretty much any other drug, there's a big difference in that it's not habit forming. That people are not going to be going to their recreational facility and buying mushrooms every single week and then consuming them on a habitual basis. That these kinds of things, they not only have an incredible uh, diminished returns the more you take them, but even just by the very nature of, of how you react to them, um, then they, they can have a, a negative reaction if you take too much. So I think really what um, the big issue is going to be is uh, misconsumption, overconsumption, and keeping people from uh, newbies, novices going in and then buying a, you know, a, a psychedelic dose and eating a whole bunch and then trying to drive home. Um, I think that's gonna be the big issue. I think that that was a, a big concern with cannabis, that in Oregon, when it became uh, recreational legal, there was a lot of talk about smoking and driving, um, but it never actually materialized. And I think that there's a lot of fear and a lot of stigma attached to it, but I think that the real community that, that utilizes this and a lot of them that grow it, um, I think they handle themselves pretty well as it is. 
I think, you know, if we go back to sort of the beginning of this conversation, and I think we all agreed that, you know, set and setting are important to, to how we use these compounds. And I think that plays into the conversation around recreational usage. I mean, if you just look at sort of the century and even millennia of indigenous usage, like these compounds were given within a specific container. And I think, you know, for that reason, um, I think we want to look to those traditions and we want to look to the science that's been done and say that, um, you know, I don't think that we have the cultural containers right now necessarily to um, let these loose on a recreational level. And, you know, clearly people can grow their own mushrooms and there are people who, who are familiar with these compounds and will safely and responsibly use them. But, you know, it's not something that I, I think we, I would want to see in a dispensary handing over to anybody with, um, you know, with the ability to pay, um, you know, and to go back to the earlier conversation about your, you know, your, your grandmother, Javier, um, or your mother, um, you know, I, I think, you know, it's important that we do go through this FDA process because there is a segment of the population and, and some elderly people that, you know, I know who, who will not touch these compounds unless they have a regulatory FDA stamp of approval and know that they've gone through sort of the rigorous testing. And if we go to microdosing, there is a lot of anecdotal evidence that it's helpful. But if you look at the science and the research that's been done, you know, it's very, you know, it's very little has been done and the results have been very mixed. Um, and, you know, it's not because I think that, um, that it won't be beneficial in some ways, but I think we need to understand, you know, what dosages, what combinations, what user groups. Um, and if you're going to the macro dosing, I think it's important that some of these screening protocols are in place and not just that you might not get the therapeutic benefit or that you could have a bad trip, but, or, or go behind the wheel of a car, but, you know, there, there is a risk that you could, you know, precipitate a psychotic episode in a vulnerable individual. And I think we want to understand that risk and make sure that um, that's being carefully screened out as well. I agree. I think thinking about the uh, you know the access overall, I, I think there's some benefit from going down the pharmaceutical route, having these uh, molecules go through controlled clinical studies, having the distribution and the dispensing managed in a professional and licensed way, as Peter was saying. The benefit there is that these these molecules, these treatments, then get into the hands of the right people. And we and initially with them we get good more likely to get good experiences. I think if we rush into the recreational pathway too quickly, you might see a lot of bad experiences, and that could have a negative uh, sort of um, effect on the whole industry and the, on the whole space and people's future access to these. So I think we should be responsible and try and encourage appropriate use, and that'll gradually lead to a broader use. I think from, from not getting that backlash. I think lessons that we've learned from alcohol and from cannabis are that prohibition doesn't work, right? Prohibition didn't work with booze, prohibition didn't work with cannabis. So I think legal safe access, and if we go back to Javier's mother, we want her to have controlled, tested product. We don't want her just having something from, from the neighborhood kid, no matter how good he can grow. Um, and then, I mean, we talk about all the potential misuse and abuse of psychedelics, but then, at, in the same breath, you can buy alcohol in the grocery store, right? Which has lots of social woes and addictions. So that's a whole larger social conversation. But I think in terms of the transformation piece that we were touching on earlier, I think it's all connected. I see Joe wanted to add something or not sure. Um, well, I was just gonna say that, that we did address this sort of thing with cannabis, the, um, especially when in regards to edibles that there were many people who had bad reactions, that they ate some and they were expecting an instant reaction like when you were smoking cannabis. And um, that they would just eat another and then they would eat another and then all of a sudden it would start to kick in and they would have a horrible time. And so in Oregon, they have a limit as to how many milligrams worth of uh, uh, THC that you can purchase in one day. And it's really all about education and putting the onus on the dispensary and the, the people who are handling this, that I don't think we should go directly to recreational. I think we should start off with a medical system similar to California, um, fairly loosely based so that people who are interested in it can go to see a doctor, uh, they can speak about it, they can get some instructions, some guidance, and then they get a card and they can go to a dispensary and pick up the products that they're looking for. I think that's, that's all that I wanted to add to it. If I could just comment on that, Javier, as well, I think you just emphasized the, point, the importance of bringing the industry professionals like the ones you have here on this panel into the conversation with the regulatory officials that will be framing this work. Uh, if we leave 
these regulatory frameworks up to those that are inexperienced or unknowledgeable about the effects of psychedelics upon uh, uh, homeostasis, how they should be delivered, how they should be dosed, and, and these controlled environments by which they should medically be administered. Um, we're going to wind up with situations where we're going to have bifurcated natures among states in the United States or countries which do not allow for the easy access or transportation of this medicine from one state to another or access for, for, for medical purposes. We saw this in cannabis happen where people were fleeing their original states to run to Cal Colorado to help their children with epilepsy. So I think right now we're at a critical juncture in the industry where we need to take a forward step and as an industry, be more assertive when contacting our legislators that are making this regulatory framework or talking about it right now and expressing the main key issues that will affect the distribution of this to the mainstream and the access. If we get this wrong and we start allowing for mainstream recreational use, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, to have access on a broad scale to macro dosing, as Amanda said, we could have dramatic negative effects in our society, which will be reported much more commonly than the positive effects. And this will, this will push our industry back five or 10 years. So in my opinion, coming from the regulatory standpoint of cannabis, I think it's quintessentially important that we set up these standards, operating procedures, and regulatory bases around dosage and administration before we really get into large scale uh, distribution. Mm -hmm. no. Why do we put the onus on the industry, whether it's psychedelics or cannabis? For instance, with alcohol, you never hear people say he was driving drunk. This is Budweiser's you know, fault. They say it was the consumer who was irresponsible. And you know what Amanda and Joe, uh, and Joe were saying earlier made me think about this Netflix documentary that came out about psychedelics. I'm from Argentina. This is where I am. This is where I grew up. We don't have this obsession with cars. And one of the things that really you know, like struck me and not in a positive way, I gotta say, was that every one of the people interviewed there at a certain point said we were driving. Why were you driving? And that was my question. And when I brought it up with my American friends, none of them had picked up on it. And to me, like the only sensible person in the entire documentary was Sarah Silverman, who said, you want to be on the passenger seat, which again, said in setting, you know, I wouldn't want to be in any car and, and, you know, on psychedelics. But like, why do we put, again, the onus on the industry and not the consumer? What, what do you think drives, it, you know, drives society to, to this perception of, of, of things, right? Why can't, like, you know, I, I don't see that in the Netherlands, right? People are, are tripping and, and it, it's really, really up to the consumer, you know, the, to well, determine their behavior and use of the substance. In and nobody United, is blaming the head shop, right? Or the uh, smart shop. In the United States, regulatory frameworks are bifurcated between the East and West. Uh, and usually is cut right down the middle by the Mississippi. And the opposed to voter legislation or referendum and, and uh, legislative rule, many times those are affected different processes. Um, I think it's most important that the industry lead the way here because we really hold the expertise, the research, the experience. Um, I'd like to highlight Dr. Daryl Hudson and Ira again. Uh, working with these compounds for over a decade gives them the experience basis to understand and educate the legislators. Now, we're not going to be the ones maybe writing the law, but we have the chance to affect those that will. And without education and educating those individuals, we really are up the creek without a paddle. And so I don't want to find myself there. And we can't make the same mistakes we did in cannabis to let it be so bifurcated, at least here in the United States. And I'll let other commenters uh, contribute of their own, own geographies. I was just going to comment on the fact that um, when you're talking about putting onus on the industry with uh, cannabis and mushrooms versus alcohol, alcohol is sort of an American standard. They, at one point, it was illegal. And they did put a lot of, of onus on, on the alcohol producers. And that now what we're doing as the industry is asking them to say, hey, let, let's give us a try. Stop making this illegal. Let us give this to the people. Here's all the good reasons why. And so because we're trying to convince the public that something that was illegal shouldn't be, it is on us to prove it to them. And in a sense, to, because we have all this knowledge, as you said, because we are more educated than the standard people that we, we put the time in, that we are the only ones who could. 
that if um, you don't really know anything about it, how do you regulate it? How do you create rules and laws that, that protect people? You really can't. Javier, I'm, I'm going to be dangerous and generalize here, but part of the, the uh, why the industry is being is wearing that mantle of having all of the responsibility, I think, is cultural. In North America, we're in a liability culture, right? It's the manufacturer's liability. I'm going to sue the tobacco company. I'm going to sue Pfizer, like all, all of those things. I'm going to go back to alcohol, and this is not, <laughs> this is not a theme. Um, but if you look at European consumption patterns of alcohol among youth, it's very different from the United States. And so I think how personal choice around consumption and culturally how, that's, how that is played out plays part of it. So I think it's a liability culture that we have here in North America. And then also how personal choices about consumption are being, um, how, we, how we raise our societies here in Canada and the US versus elsewhere. I definitely agree with Ruth on that. And back to Javier's original um, uh, point with the, the red light district in Amsterdam, that's where they sell mushrooms, that the, you can't really just go anywhere in Amsterdam and find a smart shop, that they have a designated area where most drugs are legal. And that's why they don't blame these people because they anybody going there knows that you're going there for something that you wouldn't be able to get anywhere else. And I definitely agree that that's a cultural issue, that people are used to that and they just accept it. I think there's something to be said for the congruency of what psychedelics do and uh, companies taking responsibility for what they're doing um, as an overall generalization. Uh, and I'm comfortable with that one entirely. Um, as we start to look at, you know, triple bottom lines and, um, that's what psychedelic, you know, we're looking to improve the world, right? We're looking to make better options for people. We're looking to improve mental health. So uh, we know that by having, as Bruce was mentioning earlier, more inclusive and more, um, let's just say more fair, let's just call it what it is. If we, if we start, you know, being a little bit more fair minded about this, companies ought to be a little bit more responsible for what they're putting out kind of full stop. So if we're gonna be putting out psychedelics, let's be responsible for that, especially because of how deeply ingrained that is with exactly what psychedelics are all about. Um, and we have this amazing opportunity and we do also have a lot of money that's flooding in here right now. So I think probably because one of the reasons why all of us are sort of shouting that from the rooftops and I'm, I'm gonna like, there's nodding, so I'm hoping that I'm not, but please uh, disagree if you like. Uh, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of speed, there's a lot of things happening. Do good things with it, you know, and, and be responsible for that as it comes out. And then we can lead fact-based conversations where we actually create the mar market share for everyone, but we also make the world a better place. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that definitely makes sense in terms of our shift from sort of shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. But, you know, to go back to Joseph, what you were saying originally, you know, we don't have the cultural experience around, you know, the vast majority of Americans, we don't have the historical cultural experience on how to use these compounds. So, you know, um, the education and that responsibility to make sure that these compounds are being taken the right way and, and being introduced and the delivery mechanisms are um, thoughtfully introduced falls on the on the um, on the heads and the responsibilities of the people who are bringing these new compounds to market mm -hmm. and I think there's something uh, sorry I think there's also something just to be acknowledged with you know so much of these this these substances are healing agents for the individual but anyone with experience with this or having done any research will find that it ends up being a community medicine a social medicine so we well we don't have you know the social containers or the framework set up to be able to uh, you know, to do that right now, that's, a, this is about creating it and, and psychedelics truly are a social medicine uh, and fit into that, into that sort of definition. I think this also touches a point from Amanda's standpoint is that those companies that do take that social responsibility, enact these standard operating procedures, comply with any regulatory framework that is available in their geography, will be more apt to receive investment dollars. Uh, you know, I can't speak from her standpoint as a venture capitalist, but I would assume that those that have uh, rigid standardization of their procedures, as well as advanced science associated with the delivery mechanisms, which have directly studied and, and, and efficacy shown to affect homeostasis in a positive light, um, that comply with any regulatory framework that they have identified within the geography, will be um, on the top of her list to receive capitalization. Um, those that 
are more or less operating in a more unprofessional manner, um, you know, raise the risk of providing so many medicine that are not fully understanding of how it's going to affect them. And I think that's a huge danger in our current environment right now that we need to take steps slowly, make sure that we're administering this correctly in order to advance industry globally. I'm going to take a quick minute to say, just please do your research on your psychedelics. I had a deck come across my deck the other day that had my desk that was uh, Amanita muscaria. That's the emoji mushroom. It's not even a psilocybin mushroom. This is very toxic. And when you start to look, you know, like, what are people, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it is, it's the emoji mushroom. Uh, so, you know, when we are looking at uh, the expertise in this, um, you know, having worked with these substances for so long and, you know, being down in Jamaica and, you know, Joe, you're down there right now, being able to actually see what these molecules do for people is so incredibly inspiring that I just to kind of pull this back to, you know, why are we, why is the onus on us and, and why should dollars go into that? Um, because we have this incredible uh, base of research and we're seeing what it can happen and we have legal jurisdictions where we can work in this and we also do have the FDA that's, you know, pushing through the, F, uh, through clinical trials. Yeah. I mean, so I think, yeah. Sorry, I mean, just one quick, you know, standardization, even amongst um, strains of psilocybin containing mushrooms that um, you would want to take, you know, we know that the amount of active psilocybin varies by 10x. So, you know, I think it's really important that you're, you're working with somebody who, who knows what they're doing and in terms of um, the actual experience itself. Um, you know, certainly we have talk to practitioners and facilitators who are doing things that I don't think any of any of you here would be comfortable doing or comfortable sending anybody to. So um, really important that we have more uh, regulation, regulation and standardization in, in terms of that. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I find interesting is we're going back and forth between it's a plant, right? It's natural and it's a molecule, molecule plant. And we, we go back and forth and it's it's almost a debate. It, it is a debate, actually. So, you know, synthesis versus extraction. And I know this is a big one here, right? What's the answer? You know, where, where are we going to get the most, you know, the safest, most stable, most scalable and, and accessible, affordable uh, psychedelic compounds? Is it from extracting something from the plant or mushroom in question, or is it from creating it in a lab? Yeah, like from a, from a drug development point of view, um, synthesis is always preferred. More control over the substance, more control over purity. Uh, we're working on a, on a synthesis process uh, designed to be more efficient, um, uh, because right now, quite honestly, you know, psilocybin is pretty expensive and, uh, and, the, and the process is pretty inefficient. And when we're thinking about novel molecules, um, maybe other meta mushroom metabolites outside of psilocybin, the last thing we want to be doing is disrupting those natural mushroom habitats or, or the environments of indigenous uh, peoples. So I think the synthesis route is, is uh, when we're talking about mass production and mass supply, quality control you know, um, and consistency is, is, is really the way to go for, from a pharmaceutical perspective anyway. I'm just jumping here very quickly. Um, you know, although Western medicine has really li uh, relied on single molecule compounds and synthesis, I think there's a, a point of view to be based on an Ayurvedic kind of uh, holistic whole plant medicine point of view as well. If you look at the cannabis plant, what we're finding is the isolating of the CBD actually has probably negative effects on liver enzyme production. And isolating these compounds, I think we're finding is that we're, our, our knowledge base of them is still very nascent. Uh, the, the plant or fungi was designed purposely uh, geographically DNA diversified for a reason. And uh, understanding the combination of the entourage effect, I think will, will prove to be more and more valuable in the future as we delve deeper into psychedelic effects. Yeah, Peter, I'll just respond to that. I, I, I agree with you. I think the whole plant approach can be extremely beneficial. Um, and we've seen that with cannabinoids, for sure, the whole entourage effect. Uh, but when you look at uh, these, these molecules from a drug development point of view, it's very difficult. Um, you know, and we've seen that with cannabinoids. Cannabinoids often work in combination with other cannabinoids, uh, and we don't really know yet, as you say, the, the, the 
the, the, the right combination or the right concentration of those uh, combinations. Very, very difficult to develop drugs that way. We can start with single molecules and, and uh, hopefully learn, learn from there. But uh, yeah, there's certainly values from the whole plant, whereas the whole mushroom or whatever. But um, that's, that makes it very difficult to develop drugs, unfortunately. Well, I think, you know, from a pharmaceutical perspective, um, you know, we start to look back at the, uh, the different combinations uh, and drug combinations. And that's where we're going to see, um, you know, as discussed before, um, increased efficacy, um, you know, uh, reduced uh, side effects. Um, but, you know, GW uh, has, you know, sort of set that path with what they did. So we do see a certain, um, a certain innovation. And I think that it's time to continue to innovate on that. Um, you know, the, uh, our focus is, is on the natural drug combination in order to, uh, you know, to, you know, like I said, there hasn't been a lot of innovation in a long time in pharmaceuticals. So I think that this is an opportunity for us to start, you know, stop saying let's add a single bromide or a chloride onto this and let's actually start to do something where we're looking at the entire neurological pathway. Yeah, I would, I would definitely say that this science is actually still pretty new. And that, as you said, that extraction is very expensive and difficult. Um, whether you are trying to synthesize the chemical or you are trying to extract it from fruiting bodies, it, the science just isn't there yet. But I believe in the next couple of years, we're going to have a lot of innovation. We're going to have a lot of people trying different things and, and trying to find the best way to make it uh, efficient. I've heard of people who are currently synthesizing psilocybin from yeast. They're, they're generating it from yeast. I think that's a, a brilliant idea. So what, whether it will be from fruiting bodies, of course, I would love that because I'm a cultivator, um, or whether it's going to be synthetic, it's, it's difficult to say. But just through the ease of, of growing the mushrooms and the organic structure, and uh, I agree with Peter and the whole, the, the whole body sort of experience, um, I definitely think that we'll, we'll see how it goes. You know, it's yet to be seen. Um, you know, I, I think, it, you know, as everyone has mentioned, it's super interesting and definitely worthy of, of more research in terms of, you know, what are all the compounds in these natural plants and which of them contribute to the therapeutic benefit. Um, but, you know, as, as Doug mentioned, you know, naturally derived psilocybin, for example, is unlikely to satisfy the criteria for research grade study drugs. You know, you need a replicable process that guarantees that batches have the exact same quantity, quality, and composition if you're going to take something through an FDA trial, um, which, you know, as we've mentioned before, is going to be important just in terms of getting scale and getting reimbursement of actually doing the science to prove out what I think we all believe the benefits of these compounds are. Um, but if you can do it with a naturally, you know, derived plant, that's great. Um, but, you know, it's not the same as CBD because the constraints on CBD for public sale can't be as rigorous as the constraints for psilocybin for research purposes. And, you know, just as an example, the FDA received over 800 um, botanical investigational uh, new drug applications um, in the years before 2018, but they only approved two of them, um, which, you know, just shows the high bar that you need. And, um, you know, there's a reason that um, aspirin is now synthetically derived and we're not using willow bark anymore. So I, I think, you know, as, as we look at scale and as we look at um, getting this to, as many people as possible, we need to think about that. Mm -hmm. I'm not watching the chat very closely, but I am seeing a lot of stuff pop up here. And I, I think that there is a, a fairly balanced representation of opinions on here. Um, uh, but, you know, just to point out, Marie Sabine did say that, you know, that was, she had the same experience in that. So, um, you know, I think that there's valid, uh, valid points on both sides. But again, this is really about moving this forward to getting it out to as many people as possible. Um, and that does look at standardization and regulation. So, um, you know, with that said, synthetic. However, we are looking at innovation as well. So this is the opportunity to start doing better. Yeah, no. One of, one of the comments actually in the chat, someone said this drug doesn't need development. And I thought it was spot on, I gotta be honest. But I think Amanda kind of just went into why it does need development, right? It's the same as we saw with cannabis. The plant itself is great, but there are certain ailments that require only a part of it, only certain, you know, compounds, uh, more of these compounds, uh, you know, a, a larger dose or potency, right? And here's an, another attendee saying no one wants synthetic, you know, it's, it's like, sometimes it doesn't even really matter what you want or not in terms of if you need something for, for a specific therapeutic use, you know, we are, you're, you're, I think personally, and this is a very personal opinion, I think 
uh, for instance, Chris is looking it at from, from a, a consumer perspective, right? And not necessarily a patient perspective. And I might be wrong. I, you know, again, I want to hear what the, the other panelists have to say. But, you know, I, I thought the, you know, this drug doesn't need development was a pretty good statement uh, to open the debate here. <laughs> I would definitely uh, agree. I think that um, the mushroom is probably one of the more perfect fruiting bodies that the world's created and mycelium helps most life on this planet exist. Um, drawing another allusion back to or another uh, instance back to cannabis is that we did start the industry off with almost strictly flour. Um, there was keef and hash available, um, but it wasn't really until recently that people started doing mass extraction. Uh, which allowed for the CBD industry. It allowed for concentrates and other things like that to be put into to edibles and completely diversify the cannabis industry. But it came within time. The, uh, this started off as illegal. It is still quasi illegal. It's still federally illegal in the United States. So these people who are investing $150,000, $300,000 on an extraction grow are doing it on a gamble. And they don't know if the, the DEA is going to come in and bust open their doors and just literally just start punching holes in their, in their tanks. Um, so the, as the, the laws change, as we are able to do more research and they're able to create more guidelines and structure, um, it will open up more and more people will be interested in investing in these extraction processes and creating machinery. Well, and, and I do want to say, you know, to that, you know, nobody wants synthetic. Um, some people do. Some people do want it. And, and who am I as someone who would prefer to grow a cup of tea to say you can't have access to this? Who? The people, the people that call me, the people that I speak to daily, uh, the, you know, the doctors that I speak to, the networks of doctors that have patients who are desperate for legal access to this. So you know, I urge you to uh, join your local psychedelic group to have this discussion in, in an open-minded way, because who am I to say that uh, you can only take it naturally? You know, if that's the perspective, you know, that this is, you know, the perfect thing. Uh, that's, that's not fair to, I think, everybody else who deserves access to this as well. And while I do think that people should be able to uh, grow plants and by all means do find out exactly how mycelium supports every single thing that's ever happened on this earth, literally, um, but also see how we can get it out and start to evolve our healthcare so that we can truly start to uh, improve how people feel about themselves and their connection to themselves as well as their connection to the world. And, you know, that is in opening our minds as well to synthetic and to clinical trials. And yeah, some people do want that lab version. Well, you know, I think this brings up a great point of everybody in this call in this industry. We are pioneers. We are kind of gamblers at the Korean juncture. There's not a gigantic market available for this in any regulatory stance in the world that would compare to like cannabis or anything along those lines or the drug market. Uh, but but by understanding the science behind this, and I, I you know I give credit to Doug here. Um, you know, drug development takes place in a very rigid, scaled. Uh, approach in the West. And unlike Eastern medicine or Ayurvedic medicine, um, it, it is much more uh, laboratory oriented. And so if we are going to uh, apply to the FDA and um, uh, uh, really make steps forward for massive distribution and therapeutic availability of these compounds, you know, there's our necessary steps for our regulatory bodies to understand them, because this is traditionally how they understand a new a drug application. Um, and so this is time consuming. It's very expensive. However, there are regimented procedures being placed by which have been set down that we can explore this option. And I, I've been noticing Chris here, Chris Salinas in the, in the, uh, in the chat. I think there's... Um, in, as we once again, and Ruth, I'll, I'll highlight what you said earlier again, we are very nascent in it. People are still discovering new cannabinoids in the plant of cannabis. Who's to think that we have the understanding of this hundreds of, or millions possibly years old uh, fungi that has been saving and connecting our plants for us for generations well before the, the uh, humans were walking the earth. So, um, I, you know, I compliment everybody's activity here and efforts to bring these pioneering efforts to the table. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I don't think I think it's just reality, right? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm an advocate of decriminalized nature. I'd love that we could grow mushrooms in our backyard and, and take them. I think we should have that right personally, but it's, it's my personal view. Um, but the reality is we live in a, a pretty strict regulatory framework. And if we want to bring these uh, these plant-based uh, medicines to, to people on en, en masse, then we've got to jump through those suits, just the way it is. I mean, come and join us in Jamaica and you can have a wonderful experience and then find out what we're doing here in Canada so that we can get out to the rest of the world through clinical trials, because really this is about getting it out to as many people. I think I've said that like five times today. I'll stop, I promise. <laughs> Ruth, do you want to add something? Yeah, I, um, I, I garden and I also live on a farm, um, but I also invest in companies, including psychedelic companies. So while we have this amazing brain trust in the room, um, I was just wondering if people could comment on what do you look for as an, as, when you're making investment decisions or what excites you about new businesses? What propels you towards just looking at a deck um, and moving forward? Um, obviously, the emoji mushroom is perhaps one of the things that gets you out of the room, but what are the things that keep you interested in, and get you to move forward with the company? Yeah, no, you read my mind. We, we had time actually to get into business and investing before we got into the Q&A. <laughs> so, anyone? You know, I, I mean, I'm happy to uh, kick it off. Um, that's obviously what we spend a lot of time looking on, although we also support the um, the nonprofit space here as well. Um, you know, I think first of all, as we've all said, when we look for a team that understands that the psychedelic space is not the cannabis space and requires an entirely different approach and that, you know, your monetization model is is going to be very different again, because the these compounds are, are services as much as they are products. Um, you know, we have to make sure that anybody who's, you know, moving in the space right now is acting responsibly and making sure that they're moving cautiously because any sort of an incident is going to have, as we've all talked about, repercussions for the space as a whole and can set all of us back. Um, you know, from our perspective, we, we will only back founders that are willing to work within the current legal framework um, and understand the difference between, you know, decriminal decriminalization, legalization, and, and medicalization, and, and what all of those things mean for the different business models. Um, you know, we get, you know, we get decks, uh, you know, a, across um, our desks every day that are, are talking about, you know, selling a direct to consumer uh, microdosing product in the United States, you know, next year. And, um, you know, that that's, I think, um, you know, shows a general lack of understanding of, of how the process is working. Um, and, you know, from our perspective, we do care that um, the founding team has a real connection to the mission and, and authentic, authentically wants to improve, you know, either mental health or just the betterment of humanity as a whole. Um, but when we, you know, when we look more specifically at the space, um, you know, we look at, um, you know, what are the areas for investment and, and how, how, do you, how do you look at the industry? And, you know, the industry as a whole, I, I don't think it's entirely clear and anybody who thinks they know how this is going to roll out over the next 20 years, you know, let me know because, I, I, you know, I don't think we are fully convinced, but, you know, you've got, uh, there will be, I think, a lot of value creation as, as Ruth and everyone else has said on this call around the IP side. So, you know, there's clinical research on compounds that already exist and, you know, as, as somebody pointed out in the chat, no, you don't need to, as we said, um, you know, develop a drug that already exists, but you do need to spend, unfortunately, and I will be the first one to wave the flag that our medical system is broken, but, you know, I'm not going to wait for the 20 plus years it's going to take to reform that medical system. While we can push for reform, we also have to work within it if we want to get these compounds to people as quickly as possible. So the clinical research needs to be done and needs to be done responsibly and in the right way to get these drugs approved so that you can get them into as many people's hands as possible so that, you know, insurance companies and employers reimburse them for people, right? Um, so there's the clinical research. Um, there's new drug development that drug, Doug and others have talked about, and whether that's um, creating a better version of existing compounds, maybe with faster onset, or you know, let, let's combine the heart opening of MDMA with some of the benefits of psilocybin and really creating new molecules. You know, that's another area that we think. Um, We'll have a lot of value creation and, and be interesting. Um, you know, as we've talked about, this requires an entirely different delivery mechanism. And just to explain, because I think there's a question on the chat, by delivery mechanism, I don't, I don't mean chewing the mushrooms. I mean, how are you getting these to the end user? Um, when you're talking about a six to eight hour experience that is hopefully being done by a trained facilitator, where, where is that happening? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, what, what are those facilities look like? Do they have to be created? Are they being purpose-built? Who's doing that? And you're seeing right now companies 
um, like field trip, you know, sort of enter the, the ketamine assisted psychotherapy space with purpose built facilities um, that will probably um, expand to offer those services to um, psychedelic medicine if and when that's legalized. But, you know, what, what does that look like? And then, you know, equally important, how do we train the facilitators and how do we make sure that there are enough people? Because today there are not enough people to really get these compounds in a safe, um, controlled setting to people as possible. Um, and then, you know, there's these sort of ancillary areas. There's probably um, you know, there's room for a tech layer, um, as I talked about before, you know, screening is incredibly important here. Um, and then there's, you know, obviously the, um, the prep work before you have a session and the integration work after a session. Um, and, you know, the neuroplasticity that these compounds allow give you this incredible period to work after your actual experience. And what does that sort of um, what is, it could be a, an in-person platform or it could be a digital platform that helps you integrate your lessons and, and sort of move your life forward and optimize the benefits. Um, and then there's a whole host of sort of ancillary services, whether media or others um, in the space that, that we would look at. So that's, you know, a little bit of how we're, we're looking at the space. It's an amazing summation and absolutely <laughs> what needed to be said. Um, you know, as someone who uh, has come out of the cannabis industry, um, I would just like to, you know, two words come to mind, um, expertise and integrity. And when you're looking at, you know, five to seven years and, you know, a billion dollars and, and this is, uh, this is the long haul. This is, so, you know, having those two key pillars uh, in your team where you really are drawing on the science and, uh, and have uh, a long, uh, very far vision on, on what this looks like. Um, as far as the training and you know, uh, starting to reach out to other groups, um, I did want to mention again to check out MAPS and see what they're doing, uh, if anyone is interested in that. Um, but really, as far as uh, you know, for investment or acquisition, uh, whatever the case may be, um, having, knowing what you're talking about, uh, you know, I had a deck come to me that was um, you know, completely all about uh, Mexico and all this branding about it. And I said, what's the connection to Mexico? What are you, you, know, what are you guys doing? And they said, we like it. I'm like, great, <laughs> you know, uh, so have some integrity behind what you're doing. There's an amazing opportunity to, and guaranteed if you like Mexico, there's something you can do that's good uh, to give back to the mass tech people that were, you know, persecuted for the use of this in the first place. So, uh, you know, have that integrity, have that expertise and, uh, and align with like-minded individuals to, uh, to move that forward. And I mean, with that said, Amanda, please let's have a conversation offline afterwards. Any last remarks on, on, you know, where value is, business opportunities, um, you know, just general business tips on, on, on how to create and grow business in the space, you know, before we, we get into the Q&A from the attendees? One thing I'm, I'm incredibly excited about is uh, the possible combination between the two different medicines. Um, cannabis and psilocybin, although incredibly different uh, in pretty much every single nature, except for the fact that they're both illegal federally in the United States, um, I believe have uh, potential to be used in, co in coordination and combination. Um, in my opinion, I think that, that the dispensation of therapeutic grade psilocybin compounds or non-psilocybin mushroom-based compounds will be uh, commonly distributed in a in a measured way in medical dispensaries in the near future. And so um, I believe that uh, that's a pathway forward. Uh, I'm excited for a couple of companies that I'm aware of, I won't name on this call, that are interested in purchasing large scale licenses in the United States and the cannabis industry that are also interested in uh, pursuing investments within the uh, medical psilocybin range, as well as the non-psilocybin containing uh, mushroom compound nutritional space, and that are making steps to distribute that within the United States. So I believe that the, we're gonna see the, the uh, pioneers, just like Bruce Linton, who led the cannabis industry uh, forward, come into the space and possible combinations of those types of companies in the future. Anyone else? We good. Let's go into the questions then. Uh, uh, so the first one is from Chris and he asks, how does the Jamaican government and medical establishments feel about the owl and attracting attention from psychedelics? And probably that's an Irish question, right? 
Yeah, I have, um, I have some information to share on that. So, um, you know, currently uh, psilocybin is um, legal and unregulated uh, in, in Jamaica. So there has been a call within the government at some point to, uh, to have a conversation around this. But from what I understand, the pandemic took place right after that. Uh, there are different um, educational institutions who are working with um, different groups. Uh, and uh, I do believe that those conversations have gone uh, have gone through uh, you know through the governments as well. There's going to be um, you know a decision to be made in the future uh, around this, and um, my hope is that in before that happens that we don't uh, take any wrong steps. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe add a little bit to that. Um, I'm obviously not based in Jamaica, but. Uh... We are getting ready to, uh, in the next few months, uh, kick off uh, a clinical study in Jamaica in patients with major depressive disorder. Um, in the run-up to that, we've been speaking with the Ministry of Health there, and uh, you know, that there is a willingness there, I think, or, or, or maybe a, a note of caution there with uh, this, the increased number of clinics and, and retreats uh, to put some kind of framework uh, around uh, the use of these, uh, the use of these uh, molecules, these, these drugs. Um, and so, and, just, and that's hence the willingness to support clinical studies there. So I'm not sure which direction that will go, but I, so I know that there, there's a desire within the ministry to put the, a task force together to take a, a closer look. It will likely come uh, off sort of off the heels of the cannabis. Uh, next question, I'm going to combine two questions. Um, one is from Johan, and he, he asks, um, what's the engagement and conversation we're having with medical professionals? because uh, he argues this conversation would be necessary um, because most uh, regulatory systems are guided by these professionals. Uh, and I'm combining that question with the last one by uh, Kyle, who asks uh, if any of the panelists have ideas on the most effective ways to educate and destigmatize uh, psychedelics, uh, you know, in, in, among the society, among professionals, and among policymakers. Right, so what is the status now of, of the conversations and what's the best way to go at them, basically? Yeah, I, I can speak to that a little bit, having taken some of that training as well myself. So uh, we have, you know, and unfortunately, going back again to the cannabis um, relation, you know, across Canada, for example, we have 8% of doctors or healthcare practitioners who are prescribing cannabis. So we have to look at you know, the numbers of healthcare practitioners across the board. We are having uh, a great opportunity with um, with these psychedelics to expand that outside of prescribers uh, to the psychotherapists. So um, recently co-founded the MAPS Canada support chapter here in Canada and MAPS uh, in the States and MAPS Canada, I believe the link has been shared um, previously, uh, are gonna be looking at um, how many people we can train uh, in, as, in as little amount of time. Uh, those protocols are already being um, pulled together uh, Rick Doblin, the uh, founder of MAPS in the States, has uh, gone publicly saying he would like to uh, train up to 200,000 therapists uh, on, on this, uh, you know, over the next 10 years. It's just so um, astronomical numbers as to how many of these people want to reach. Uh, but as far as, uh, the, you know, we're going to have to look at traditional models. So that's going to be uh, educational credits for, uh, for practitioners right now, and they're going to be depending on likely some of these uh, companies and some of these different organizations to provide that information, um, similar to what we saw with, uh, with the cannabis space. Ruth? One thing that I find um, exciting about the psychedelic space and the conversation with the medical community, just comparing it to cannabis. So almost exactly a year ago, Bruce Lynch and I were at the Northwind Institute, which was a think tank with medical practitioners, people from industry, lawyers, accountants, um, policymakers. The only stakeholder in, in cannabis that was missing was the government, unfortunately. Um, and from the medical community, the conversation was, give me a double blind study, right? I understand that there are efficacies, there are anec there's anecdotal evidence, but as a scientist, I need the science before I can go into a clinical practice and actually administer this particular substance. So I think the fact that with, with uh, psychedelics, that there are these studies, and there is such traction with the FDA right now and breakthrough status, um, I think that will really open up the conversation with doctors because there is such an IP and science background to this. So I think that's heartening. Um, and then on the education piece, I mean, it's all, it's all normalization um, and education from, from everywhere, including harm reduction um, and then just 
education from, from plant to the experience to afterwards. Any additional comments? If not, so another question is from Kane. How do we generally define successful treatment in mental, list, in mental illness, right? In right. Jamaica, he says, uh, it means the individual no longer causes trouble or discomfort or dangers to other people. But, you know, we all know that is definitely not the definition of success for, for I mean, I think that sort of, uh, that touches on an important issue, which is like, what is mental illness? And I think, you know, it's a term that we've thrown around here, but, you know, I, I think mental wellness, again, is a spectrum. And I don't think any of us are in the bucket that we're all, you know, we're well, and we don't, we don't need some improvement, you know. Um, so, you know, I, I think we, we use those labels conveniently and again, needed within our medical system for, for people to get treatment and get it reimbursed, but um, not something that I think is, you know, clearly a dividing line between somebody who has depression and somebody who's just, you know, sort of mildly unhappy. But um, how do we define, you know, going back to um, the conversations that you, you know, the industry needs to have with medical professionals? Well, you know, the medical professionals are looking for certain endpoints in, in these trials and, you know, they can be defined by, you know, there's, there's a number of um, standardized psychiatric measurement forms, um, either self-reported or clinician reported where people measure, you know, your degree of um, improvement, um, you know, MAPS, for example, in, in their great work on PTSD is able to, um, using some of those forms, um, show that people no longer qualify for a PTSD diagnosis according, you know, using those frameworks um, after they've gone through the MAPS protocol. Um, so that is, that is one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is are people, um, are people still using their psychiatric meds? So, um, you know, remission could be measured by, you know, you're no longer using an SSRI and, you know, at what point in time, you know, for how long do you no longer feel like you need that medication? Um, where it relates to addiction, you know, is it very obvious, like, you know, what is your usage? And it might not be, <clears throat> you know, in some cases, you know, it's a complete remission and recovery. In some cases, it's, um, you know, people have talked about the importance of even just being able to reduce reliance on some of those compounds. So, you know, I think we have, um, well, I think I agree with maybe the sentiment of the question, which is, you know, how are we characterizing well? Um, but I think we have some, some measurements in place that at least will get us through the current system. I think Amanda brings up another great point here um, about really how effective is it? It's about integration. Uh, a lot of these plant medicines, although they'll have a, an effect on your mental state of mind in a shorter period of time and perhaps a long in, uh, longer lasting effect in your consciousness, um, it's really about how you integrate those changes into your life. Uh, you know, we could have somebody have a temporary hi hiatus or a relief from their addiction, but if they continue to put themselves in environments that uh, lend them to bad behaviors or repetitive behaviors that have proven to be negative effect on, on their lives, um, they're going to follow those same patterns once again. So it's really about how we uh, not only appropriately dose this, uh, apply it under a therapeutically measured administrative uh, uh, sequence standard operating procedure, but also how we provide these patients instruction upon their continued integration of these medicines and their new status of, uh, of mindset. Yeah, and it's not one size fits all, of course. Uh, the FDA will require data in each specific indication. So uh, that, so there, and their mental illness is broken down into DSM to many, many, many different, uh, different indications, whether it's PTSD or anxiety or depression, each of those has its own measurement scale. Uh, so, for example, in depression, we'll be monitoring uh, the MADRAS scale, which is a, which measures the, the severity of someone's depression. And after over periods of time, we'll be measuring the improvement on that scale. Uh, so it won't be one size fits all. I mean, a, 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 a drug uh, approved for depression will have to go through more work to be approved for anxiety or for ADHD, so that the audience understands that. Well, we can also start to depend on technology in many cases with this as well. You know, for example, um, you know, being able to uh, to put certain molecules on, you know, perhaps a, you know, a 3D uh, printed uh, tissue culture where we can just start to gather this information. And, and, you know, what we're doing at the lab right now is, is you know, depending on a lot of that technology and as we move forward, uh, especially with this drug development um, in, in, this, in this space, uh, we are going to see uh, incredible leaps and gains through that on how we can measure success and how we can 
how we can focus uh, our work uh, in order to, to reach those uh, successes uh, more quickly as well. I think it's not just about measuring success after the fact. I mean, we're looking at a number of uh, AI platforms that are taking in data from uh, microdoses, for example, mm -hmm. and uh, looking at the outcomes uh, from uh, the, 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 those, those people are experiencing. But uh, tracking, uh, using pretty significant large uh, questionnaires, tracking their inputs. So from that, you can potentially identify biomarkers for people that are more likely to benefit from microdosing or are more at risk from that going forward. So the technology will help us select patients going in so we'll get a better outcome at the other end, hopefully. And I was just gonna touch back on what Peter was saying and how important the integration process is, is that I think that psilocybin is an amazing and extremely powerful chemical, but it is a tool. Um, though it does have profound effects, it, it can only do good if you use it properly. And that having somebody else there being able to help you interpret it, being able to help guide you on a better path uh, once you've made that realization. Because I think with the default mode network down, you're able to see your whole uh, life clearly in it, and it really brings to the surface a lot of truth. But if you then go off the chemical and you go back to your life, all of those choices that you make, you, they just come right back and you just go right back into your, your old habits. I appreciate you saying that, Joseph. I mean, a lot of these, um, I think w one of the comments that I'd like to highlight here in the chat room is from Bobby, um, intention. You know, we, we're going into these uh, realms with intent to correct behaviors or patterns within our uh, mental homeostasis that are causing us harm. So we have an intent to seek out therapeutical solutions, but it's really about how we integrate that solution into our daily lives, that we find ourselves being relieved of that intent or those symptoms that are causing us harm. So really appreciate you saying that and, and emphasizing the point of that, Joseph. Because well, without, in, without intent, it's purely just recreation at that point. Well, I think, um, you know, for the audience here and, you know, we're all, we're all in the Sakyo chamber and we, we talk about it all the time, but when we look at, you know, what other businesses and what other opportunities are there here, uh, you know, it's important to, you know, as Pete was saying, to, to look at those, you know, what I, what we sort of call as the pillars around, around psychedelic use, which is, you know, the pre-experience, which is, you know, grounding yourself, having that, that, you know, that therapeutic support, having a support system around you, creating that intention, having the right state of mind to go in that. And there's many different things that you can innovate a, a around that to, to create that supportive container. And then you have the experience itself. And within that experience, you want to look at the set, setting and dosage. So, you know, what is the mindset of the individual? What is the geographical lo location? Are they worried about uh, the legality of this? How, what, is the, what is the state of mind going into this? You know, what physically does this room look like? And who is there to do it? And then, of course, the, uh, you know, the dosage itself uh, and being confident in what you're taking. And then looking at the third pillar that we consider as just the post-integration, which is uh, not only post-acute, so, you know, immediately right afterwards, how are you experiencing yourself, you know, being so much more sensitive, um, chorus, and then looking at this long term integration uh, that we keep coming back to and that keeps getting mentioned. And there's so much opportunity to support uh, patients and participants throughout that entire journey uh, that, you know, coming from, uh, you know, being able to work with this and having created an access point to it. Uh, that is the number one you know, most important conversation that we're having with individuals who are interested in joining this industry is really to look at the bigger picture around this and, and you know, uh, not be myopic in your view of, of what psychedelics are. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more question and, and I think it's from Ken. Um, he asked if, if we foresee any kind of legal relationship between a sacramental farmer who can cultivate uh, psilocybin mushrooms, dry them, power them, you know, to specs and supply them for medical uses, say in Canada, right? Um, and, and that is, of, of course, something that, that many people in, I, I assume Canada's in Jamaica, many people in, in, in emerging countries um, are expecting, right? It, many of the markets we, we propose are often geared toward exporting for, for them to generate real value uh, locally. So do you, do you see this as something viable or, or not at all? So I'll, I'll just jump in with the international legal framework. So in 
the 60s in that decade, there were three international drug treaties that govern the trade, import, export of various substances, including psychedelics and cannabis, which is a whole other conversation we can have later on. So I think that is um, a big hurdle for, for what would happen with export. And I think we're a long ways away. Uh, it doesn't mean that what's happening in individual jurisdictions isn't important though. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you, would it even make sense to export uh, psilocybin mushrooms, right? I know we keep going back to cannabis, some people don't like it, but it's, it's, it's just right there for comparison, right? It's, it's an easy comparison, so my apologies. But, you know, we see people growing cannabis in warehouses in Canada, and we don't see them growing mangoes or whatever. And, and the only reason is, is legality, I think, right? And it would make sense to, to grow cannabis and hemp in, in, in low cost, uh, you know, regions and outdoors. Not so much the same with, with, with psilocybin mushrooms, right? You can grow them in your kitchen. You can grow them in, in, a, in a room, like in a sanitary, perfectly, you know, compliant room. But it, it can be like a very small room as well, right? You don't need so many of those conditions. So would it make sense? What would be the argument for exporting, say, psilocybin mushrooms from Jamaica to Canada? Well, if you don't mind me jumping in, um, I would say that especially when you compare it to the cultivation process of cannabis, mushrooms are far less uh, picky. They don't require as much energy. They don't require the lights, the, the same kind of uh, monitored conditions. Uh, generally, if you get things set right at the beginning and you, and you know what you're doing, all you really need is a controlled space. And so when you look at places like Jamaica, where they are looking to export cannabis and, and CBD, that's because you can produce lots of cannabis here down in the equatorial region for very expensive prices. But when talking about shipping mushrooms, for me, I, and I've talked to people about this both in the, the legal realm and in the black market, that if you're going to be shipping all these mushrooms from one place to another, if it's legal there, there's no point in you shipping them. You just go there and start growing them right where they are, and then you have them without having to, to deal with all of the, 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 the costs, the, the transport costs. That's, that's my point of view, at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure it was a loaded question. I mean, I, I wanted to see if anyone had a, a, like a pro-export ar argument, right? And I, and I mean like basic materials, right? Not a finished, pharmaceutical product where we, you know, again, IP and all the, these other factors come into play. Um, to participate in that question here, Javier, I, last year I was working as a director of cannabis client services for a Fortune 500 law firm called Zuba Lawler, and we helped many companies apply their technology, either to patent to the U.S. Trademark Office, to obtain new dietary ingredient, FDA designations, or generally recognized as safe designations. I think the FDA has given you a clear pathway on how to first apply to a larger market here. Psilocybin, although very effective in, in, in a psychoactive effect, a lot of um, the advancements, I think, to normalize mushrooms in the day, daily dietary uh, ingestible purpose for at least the United States population would be really start with the non-psychoactive, non-psilocybin-containing effects that can be integrated very easily into our dietary or nutritional markets. Uh, we're really excited about combining different compounds like lion's mane and uh, the ability to offer that into a nutritional market, obtain FDA guidance for either generally recognized as safe or a new dietary ingredient, which is much less cost effective and faster in the development and application to a larger market um, than a psychoactive compound would be or a new a drug application, which takes a long time and a lot of money. So, you know, for me, I, I believe the first market uh, that we're really going to open up for the awareness of the American public is really in those that are non psilocybin containing that do have an effect on your comfort levels or anxiety or can relieve you from the normalized day to day stress. Those are, in my opinion, the first open market available to us, and the FDA is openly accepting those applications now. Um, whereas we're going to have some time in order to integrate psychedelic psilocybin into a normalized therapeutic environment widely across the United States. Well, and make, make no mistake, if you're looking to get into the psychedelic space or make the jump from, jump from cannabis, this is not, um, this is not a, a capacity concern. So, you know, you're, if, 
you start growing mushrooms and you can do it well and you got a shipping container, I mean, you've got more than you need for um, probably half the country, especially when we look at the numbers of, you know, how many people, uh, you know, the, the number of grams that are being uh, consumed by people um, in this market specifically. So just want to point that out because a lot of people are, um, I've got this great space and I'm not growing weed in it. What can I do with it? You probably have a bit too much space. So I think we don't want to hear about square feet, right? I think that's probably something, a metric we don't need to hear about, right? Um, what about, so one um, acronym from cannabis that I think has found its way into psychedelics is EU GMP. And we just talked about the export question and also the production question in terms of what, what fungi actually need. Does anyone actually need an EU GMP space? I mean, and, and I'm leaving aside the whole pharmaceutical drug um, manufacturing production. I'm just talking about fungi and, and where are we with that and where does EU GMP fit in? I, I, you know, just to, from an uh, infrastructure standpoint, I, I always believe in setting up institutions correctly to comply with importation eventually when it happens. It's, it's a cumbersome thing. We've seen it again and again in the cannabis industry, um, especially when companies are interested in importing maybe refined CBD into Europe that the regulatory standards that are set for those importation markets to receive that product really should be complied upon when you're uh, originating your institution. You don't want to go back and have to retrofit it or get it audited a second time in order to make sure that you're compliant with the markets that you eventually want to import into. Now, those are, are, are limited to the current juncture. It's always good to start it off right. So, um, in my opinion, that would be a correct way to begin. But uh, I'm sure there's differing opinions here on the panel. Any last or questions? Not. We're way over time. So <laughs> unless anyone has anything else to say about this specific topic, last call. <laughs> okay. So unfortunately we are done for today. Uh, but thank you everyone for joining panelists, attendees. Thank you everyone for your questions and for sticking with us for quite a long while. <laughs> Um, I, I don't know if that was me. <laughs> I think it was. Um, well, thanks again, and we hope to see you again in the next uh, Canex uh, webinar event. I think maybe Doug just tuned in. Do you want to sign well, up? I've been, I've been listening, and it's been absolutely captivating. So I really just want to say thank you to everyone for their their contributions there. I think it's uh, it's been again, you know. Starting off, we were happy to have this degree of expertise joining us, but I think in conclusion, um, what I'm most proud of is that I think that we've done a lot to contribute to people understanding the, the landscape for psychedelics moving forward, and hopefully to better inform them in terms of the channels that they can pursue to expand their, their education and further their own interests in pursuing this. So Javier, thank you for a brilliant job, and really and truly to all the panelists, I'm deeply indebted uh, personally on behalf of Canic. So thank you everyone for, for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Javier. Thanks for your